Hey everybody, this is Eddie Hamilton. I am the editor on Top Gun Maverick, and this is my Avid Timeline tour. What you can see in front of you is the complete timeline of the entire movie, reels one to seven. And what you'll notice here is you can easily see where the flight sequences are because they're really teeny tiny little bits of dialogue and action all kind of squeezed together in lots of short cuts. So if you look at it at a glance, you can see the first section is about a third of the way through, which is our first basic flight maneuvers dogfight sequence where Maverick is shooting down the pilots and getting them to do push-ups. And we use Won't Get Fooled Again by The Who. Then there's a little training one a bit further down. Then there's another training one. And then you can see the gigantic final mission about three quarters of the way down you know, which is like 20 minutes. And then there's a little section there where Maverick and Rooster are behind enemy lines. And then the final dogfight between the F-14 and the Su-57s is right at the end there. And then the little section on the end is where they land and celebrate. And we have the little section back in Mav's hangar where Penny arrives with her daughter and they fly off. And uh, Rooster taps the photograph of him and Mav. And then the, la the chunk of red at the end is the end credits. So when we work on these large movies, we break the film up into roughly what used to be 2,000 foot reels of 35 millimeter film, which was about 20 minutes of screen time. So we still do that in the Avid Media Composer in order to keep the chunks of action manageable. And it also allows my team to work on other bits of the movie while I'm working on one separate piece of the movie. And also we can turn over bits of the film to sound and music in chunks. So we may have finished kind of like the middle section of the movie before we finish the beginning and the end. So we can turn over, say, reels two, three, four and five. And I'm still working on reel one and reel six and seven. So it allows us to keep everything going at the same time. So what we'll do is we'll go in to have a look at reel one. So we're looking at reel one now. And you'll notice that the top few tracks, there's a, there's a TC1 track there, which basically splits the audio and the video. It's quite common for editors to do this, but you'll see that I've labeled all the tracks, which is very useful. I highly recommend that everyone does that. So everyone knows what's supposed to be on what track. And the reason I have so many video tracks is so that we can keep track of a lot of things simultaneously. So what you're looking at is the finished timeline of the movie. When I'm starting to assemble and I'm refining the edit, I will normally have a lot of options for each thing stacked up. And so this is a very simplified version of the timeline where we've tidied it up for the purposes of finishing the movie in the DI and the color grading and the final visual effects. But V1 drama is the original shots straight out of the camera and dropped onto the timeline. And then the next two layers above that are visual effects iterations of shots and then the final vfx shots are on v4 the color is on v5 so sometimes it'll be color effects like you can see there and sometimes it will be clips that we've got back from the di which we will drop in because they're colored but joseph kaczynski really works on the color for every screening and sometimes would actually dive in on the media composer himself and color correct shots and then you'll see notes that I've put on V6. Now, what they are at the beginning of Real One, those are actually the different title cards for the beginning of the movie. But quite often I'll have a separate track for title cards, a separate track for subtitles, and then a separate track for edit notes. But because this is later in the process and we've collapsed the timeline down, that's why it looks simple. But the edit notes track is something where I put a sub cap on and I type in useful things that the VFX department might need to know you know, there's a lot of visual effects in this movie and you may not realize what the visual effects are because they're kind of invisible. So the VFX subcaps track is a small subcap that's in the top left corner of the screen where we have a visual representation of every shot number. And we will also have a marker on it on each of those so so that the, the timeline is searchable and each VFX shot is given a a number which is normally based around the scene number and then an underscore and then a two or three letter abbreviation and then an underscore and then a unique four digit VFX number, which allows us to keep track in a gigantic database, a gigantic file maker database of every visual effects shot and all the elements that go into that shot and all the notes from each iteration of the shot. This is all very common on movies like this where you're, you're keeping track of an awful lot of data 
And then the version zero is where the VFX team take our original camera plate and they put it through their, their color pipeline and their sizing pipeline and they send it back to us to make sure that what we're getting back is exactly the same as the camera original dailies. So they've taken the color from the dailies, the CDL values, the, the color decision list values that have been generated by the lab. They've applied them through the VFX pipeline and they've taken the camera original files and managed to transcode them back. So they sit perfectly in the Avid with the same color, which is very important because when you're dropping visual effects into the film, if you've got color effects running on the layer above, you want the color to be the same for the VFX shot and the original camera data. So new VFX EH. Now this is crucially important for me. I know that not every editor does this, but I really like to see all the new shots that are going into the movie on a daily basis. So my team will cut any new VFX shots that come in every day onto that track. And then on the real name in the, in the cutting copy folder, they'll write a little VFX at the end. So I know that VFX shots have been added. And every morning, one of the first things I do is I skip through the V9 track, look at all the shots that have been submitted, and I drop them down into the film. And then I also can write notes for each shot. If there's anything which I feel needs improving, I'll write a quick note to the, to the VFX team with the shot number. And then if the shot is not an improvement, sometimes I'll mute the shot so that the previous version of the shot is there. But quite often I'll just drop it straight down and nudge all the VFX shots on the layers below down one. And then the VFX shot, which is the oldest, kind of gets popped off the bottom of the list. You'll see on my timeline for Mission Impossible Fallout for the next two Mission Impossible movies, Dead Reckoning Part 1 and 2. Above that, I have a track. Actually, it's below the VF. It's above the version zero and below the VFX EH track. It's a track where I have every version of every visual effects shot collapsed into a single clip. So if we ever want to go back to an earlier version of a shot, sometimes you can have up to 40, 50, sometimes even 70 versions of a shot to make it look really good. And you can have them all collapsed in there and then you can step into that clip and look at earlier versions if the director wants to go back. And then finally, Company 3 Color there. That's the, the final graded version of the movie back from Company 3 who did the color on Top Gun Maverick. So if we whiz down to the sound. So again, it's very important. If you're working on a complex timeline, it really helps to label your tracks. And Avid's been able to do that for quite a few years now. But I remember when, when I started out, all you had was A1, A2, A3. But the fact that you can label them now is super helpful. So DX Dialogue, DX stands for Dialogue, so four mono tracks there, which is the original production audio. Now, the thing about the ADR is if you, if you, let's, let's go down to say, let's open up Reel 3. The beginning of Reel 3 is the first big aerial dogfight sequence. And you'll notice that it's a very, very busy little timeline at the beginning there. You see the first half of that Reel is super busy. And you can see how there's a lot of dialogue going on. And quite often it's different versions of line readings of each line. And what I will do selectively is mute various ones. In fact, I think you can see some of them grayed out. In fact, no, I think my assistant has unmuted everything just so you can see all the tracks that I had there. If you looked at the timeline that, that I pressed play on, some of these clips are muted, but I have several options. And then what we would do is we have this new ADR track, which is the bottom two. And whenever we recorded a different version of a line from a pilot, we would stick it on there so that I would know those were the newest lines. And you can see that I'm using clip colors here to help me work out who is talking. So if I recall, you know, Phoenix was pink and rooster was that brown color and hangman was yellow if you go up to the picture i think it's slightly clearer on the picture tracks but you can see there that on the v1 track you can see when i'm like the the exterior shots of jets are green i think and then payback and fanboy i think maverick was blue and payback and fanboy and then and then phoenix i can see at a glance how much coverage of each character i'm using on the timeline and how much how many exterior shots i'm using you can see also that there's a lot of resizes. I'm trying to remember what the resizes are for, probably because I was reframing shots or something to make them be slightly closer to a, to a pilot or reframe a shot of an exterior shot of a jet to bring it bigger and closer. You can see there right at the beginning, there's a flop shot. 
So the second shot in the reel is flopped because I needed the jets to be going right to left instead of left to right. You can't really tell when the shots are going fast if they're flopped or not. If you could tell, we would change the, the lettering on the side of the jet so that the, the letters weren't reversed. If you scroll down on the sound, we'll keep going through down the sound. So dialogue tracks, new ADR. So the 5-1 DX dialogue track and the 5-1 crowd track. So we were working with Skywalker Sound for the most part on the sound for this film, apart from when the pandemic hit, when everyone shut down. And I was in London with Tom Cruise and Chris McQuarrie and Joe Kaczynski was in LA with Jerry Bruckheimer. And we ended up taking the sound mix back to London and so we took all the Sky the Skywalker elements and did the final sound mix with a different team in London because that's where Tom was. And Joe and Jerry would monitor the mix remotely every day. But for the most part, we worked at Skywalker and it was a huge pleasure. What I would ask them to do is send me five one stems of the dialogue and the crowd. And you can see that that's soloed at the moment. So if I press play, then I would hear the dialogue track. And you can see I've got the, the Foley track there. The 5-1 Foley is soloed and the 5-1 effects and backgrounds as well. And then the 5-1 music stem down there. So, so if I play all of those, then you'll hear the finished mix of the movie. And then right at the bottom, you can see the, the Atmos bounce, which is a 7-1 Atmos bounce of the final mix, which I have there. And you'll see that... I like to use different clip colors so that I can see what each track is doing. So at a glance, all the clips on the timeline are all different colors. So I can see what the dialogue track is and then what the, the Foley and the, you know, the effects and the background and the music. I use a lot of keyframes. So right there, you can see on the music track, it says, uh, won't get fooled again there. It says from the who now this is a, an edited version of the track from Cecile Tornasak, our music editor. And when I'm working with the music to kind of get it working with the film, sometimes I'll have the dialogue and the effects running. If there was an old music track there, I'll mute it and then I'll, I'll enable the new track and then I'll mix it in with all the keyframes. That's just how I prefer to do it. Some other editors do it a different way, but I really like using keyframes because you know that they're definitely going to work. Because if you, if you use crossfades, sometimes you'll accidentally delete them or the levels will change and you won't know. Whereas with keyframes, you can definitely see what everything's doing. And you'll see there's a lot of keyframes in the dialogue tracks. Like when I'm working on dialogue scenes, I do, I, I really work on the dialogue a lot to make it sound smooth. If you scroll down to the middle of this reel, you'll see the scene, you know, like there's the sailing scene and the scene where, yeah, so here's, we've got a dialogue scene there, the green scene. So you'll see, I think that's probably Phoenix and Rooster on the tarmac talking. And then the scene after that is the scene where Maverick gets uh, shouted at by Cyclone. What I like to do is even numbered scenes, I will color green and odd numbered scenes, I'll color blue. And then when you're looking at the timeline at a glance, you can see the relative lengths of each scene. So when you're judging the pace of the movie, you can see how long each scene is in relative terms to the scene before and after. Although, interestingly, on Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, because there's a lot of characters, I've actually started using coloured subclips for each character. So the blue and the green doesn't quite work the same way when you see the Dead Reckoning timeline, because I'm using clip colours for each character to help me, because there's, there's so much going on in some of the scenes, and it's really useful to know how much of each character you're using. It's like I did in the, in the aerial sequences here, I'm doing it for every scene in Mission Impossible. And if you look at, say, reel six, where the final mission is, which was easily the hardest sequence to edit. In fact, I think it's the end of reel five is where we start the final mission. The first half of reel six there is the kind of last two thirds of the final mission. And then you can see when they get in the F-14 and then there's the little green section there where they're talking back to the aircraft carrier. Rooster is this kind of brown color and Maverick is blue. So you can see how much of each character is talking there. You can see how busy the timeline is for these aerial sequences. It was a real challenge to keep track of everything. And, you know, the timeline gets very, very busy. Even when you're looking at a 20 minute sequence, it's still very tight. So that's it, guys. Great to talk to you all and good luck with all your projects. And uh, thank you all for watching. I'm thrilled that the movie's done well and that Lots of people have been to the cinema to see it. It's such a treat.